Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. So since you are all very smart people who I'm sure have already read the title of this episode, you kind of have an idea what this is about. Um, I sit down and talk to Nancy Rommelman, who, if you do not know who Nancy is, she is a journalist who writes for Reason, the New York Times, the LA Times, the LA Weekly, the Wall Street Journal, other publications, and she has also written a book. It's called To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder, which is a fantastic book if you are somebody who, like me, likes to read nonfiction stories about people who are messed up human beings who do other messed up things to other human beings, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. What me and Nancy talk about is her current situation with her little SJW online mobbish certain situation and also the YA situation and just various other things that we wanted to talk about. So without further ado and without making this intro too awful long, here is me and Nancy sitting down and talking about just various things. So here we go. Hi, Nancy. Hey, Jen. Hey, how's it going? Good. Okay, cool. So I guess where we should probably start for people who don't know the backstory of why we're having this conversation, um, kind of explain what has happened over the past six weeks now. Yeah, I think it's probably more like nine weeks at this point. Oh, my um, God. Okay, uh, so what happened? So um, last summer, a journalist named Leah McSweeney and I um, wound up both writing about Aja Argento, the actress, after her boyfriend, um, Anthony Bourdain, had committed suicide. Leah and I did not know each other, um, but we found each other, and we both had some pretty strong feelings about Argento kind of um, being the face of the Me Too movement. Um, she had had... A sexual relationship, uh, at first not consensual, then consensual with Harvey Weinstein. Um, and, and she'd really been given a lot of um, prominence by Me Too, which was, of course, massive for a long time. And, and Lee and I both thought that was probably not the like greatest person to have as your, you know, figurehead. You know, then it came out that she had had, um, Asha Argento had had sex with a 17-year-old, uh, Anthony Bourdain, before he committed suicide, helped to pay off this young man who was going to bring it to the press right when uh, Asha was getting all this sunshine. And then when it came out that she had done this, she denied it, then she admitted it, and um, it was kind of a mess. So Leah and I started having lots and lots of texts about this. But I was in New York and we met, and um, we decided to do a little video podcast or vlog or whatever they call it. Um, called Hashtag Me Neither Show, um, where we talked the first episode about some of the excesses of the Me Too movement. Um, in subsequent episodes, we talked about um, victim culture. We talked about the difference between, you know, a real sexual predator like R. Kelly and someone like Aziz Ansari, who gets swept up in the excesses, you know, according to us. Little half hour show, you know, not particularly good tech. Um, and, you know, I think in three episodes, we'd had like, 5,000 viewers. It was basically, you know, pretty below the radar until early January um, when a former employee of my husband's coffee roasting business um, had found out about the show uh, and wrote a letter to other former and current employees, most of whom she had hired when she'd been there, and um, said the, uh, the show I was doing was I don't remember the exact words, like deeply offensive and grotesque or dangerous, and um, got a lot of people to sign a letter and then sent it to the media um, because she felt it was her responsibility to show that my uh, opinions um, could create a potentially dangerous environment for uh, the employees of my husband's business, Ristretto Roasters, and also for the community at large. And um, I mean, Jen, I guess you can take it from there. Um, it, you know, it's sort of exploded um, and has been pretty devastating to my husband's business. 
Yeah, everything's kind of gone sideways for poor Nancy in her husband's business. Well, really, really more for my husband's business um, because, you know, they don't, they didn't, I mean, they did, yeah, okay. I mean, people did come after me, obviously lots of nasty things were said and, you know, there was a death threat and there was a, you know, so I read that I was, you know, on meth and mentally ill and all that stuff. But but mostly they didn't come after me. And, and as I think you probably know, you know, when this all happened, I was trying to sort of like, you know, come after me, come after me, like standing in the field, waving my arms saying, you know, leave my husband's business alone and come after me. But that was not going to make the impact that they wanted. Um, and so they decided to... Uh, do their best to destroy their my husband's business. Um, for many weeks, uh, many people have been calling all of his um, purveyors and wholesale accounts and and saying, you know, uh, Nancy is a rape apologist and, um, you know, don't work with Ristretto. And, and, you know, many of them have left. It's been really, really hard for him. You know, he's he built this, like, with his own hands and heart and money, uh, 15-year-old business. And to have this happen has been really super sucky, I got to say. Um, much harder for him than for me. I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist 20, 25 years. I'm used to some of this stuff. I'm from New York. Um, but it's it's been pretty ratty. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing that really kind of pisses me off about this whole situation is that they didn't come for you. It's like, if you have a problem with what somebody's saying, fine, come at that person. But this is an attack basically on your husband because of what you said. And it's particularly rich to me that feminist and those who want to rail against the patriarchy all of a sudden want to use your husband to try to silence you it's like are you kidding me with this like well yes i mean i mean this is so the irony is is very rich um their argument is that because i had previously worked with my husband's business and because i guess i married to him that that just you know axiomatically um created a threat and and what really kind of goads me especially as someone who you know listens to people for a living um, and I listen to people, you know, often in extremely different, difficult situations, you know, someone they know has been murdered or they've had real devastation. Um, I invited people to talk about this, but they don't really want to engage in discussion as far as I can see, because, and also as far as I can see, they don't really have arguments. What they have are opinions. And it's like, okay, that's your opinion that I am a horrible and dangerous person. What's your argument? Like, let's talk about it. And that has not been... Um, in their interest, um, at least so far. So, yeah, and it's it's really illuminating when you watch it happen to somebody who you know, and especially if if it happens to you, how really kind of intellectually disingenuous it is because you're not really looking for a solution to the problem. You don't want to have a discussion. You just want to be angry at somebody for something that. Honestly, you whatever, who cares? I see people say things all day that I don't agree with. I don't take it upon myself to go try to like destroy somebody's life. Like that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Well, well I think that um I, I really can't say whether the intent is destruction is to destroy. I mean it, it seems like that. Um, or if, if it almost becomes and I and I wrote an op ed piece about this for, for the LA Times, they asked me to write. Um it becomes almost like an addiction. You get addicted to the next sort of crusade. And there was a situation here in 2017, um, and, and it, it got a lot of national press, so you may have heard about it. Some young girls, actually one of whom graduated from high school with my daughter, though my daughter didn't really know her, um, went down to Mexico. They learned how to make like these delicious, incredibly buttery tortillas. You know, they asked some locals who were eh, kind of like okay with giving them stuff, but like, you know, get out of here, girls, came up. Uh, created uh, a burrito cart, a nice little piece about them in one of the local papers, like, oh, yeah, these girls went down and got some recipes and made these burritos. And the end, right? No, not the end. Because within a day, um, they were, you know, charged, you know, people were very angry, and it's cultural appropriation, and how dare you, you're not Mexican, and you stole these recipes from these indigenous women, and are you going to pay them? And I mean, I, I'm sure your listeners can fill in the blanks here. But so I was doing a little research on this yesterday, and the, the thing that really started the conflagration was this article in the Portland Mercury by a girl that said they shouldn't have done this and da-da-da-da-da and how awful they were. And then someone else followed up with this long list of 60 restaurants in Portland that, you know, a Mexican restaurant not owned by a Mexican and a Thai restaurant, pop-pop, not owned by a Thai guy. Absolutely not okay. Don't ever go to these places again. 
So I'm like, all right, let me check out this editorial, see how they contributed to the fire. Oh, the Portland Mercury piece, that's down. And with a little explanation saying, oh, sorry, you know, we really shouldn't have published this because uh, we had our facts wrong. Uh-huh. Oh, and the cultural appropriation restaurant list, oh, that's down too. So people are going willing to go in and just, these girls, okay, they got death threats and closed in two days. So yeah, people- I remember hearing about that story, and it's it's really it's dumb because first of all, it's two women opening their own business. Like you should be celebrating that, but then you also want to make the argument that I guess okay, so you're saying only Mexicans can make burritos? Like that's kind of racist. Well, so so to finish just one thought, it's like you're you're willing to destroy other people, but you're not willing to stand by your tools of destruction. That really pisses me off. Like I've had people say, "Are you sorry you did the show?" I'm like, I, "No, not at all." Meaning the meaning of their show. I, not at all. I, you know, I stand by. I, I could have had better tech, and I will someday. But you know, to go out and destroy people and then like back away from it and just just delete it. That that is really really craven. Um, um, what was your question just now? The second part. Oh, oh, yeah, about the part about this whole cultural appropriation thing, basically, and also like saying that only Mexican people can right. make burritos. Like, right. okay, well, that's that's racist. It it absolutely is, and and I have to give a little credit to Willamette Week, who's one of the uh, 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 weeklies here in town. They got five restaurateurs together, like you know, a Mexican guy, a Thai guy, a, and a white guy who makes Mexican food, and they sat them in a room and they're like, guys. Food is creativity, food is love, food is joy, food is, you know, it's a currency the world over. And we absolutely should open the doors and be able to eat whatever we want and cook whatever we want with whoever we want. And we should be able to write whatever we want. I mean, it's so obvious, but for people that just, for reasons that, you know, kind of elude me, feel that that's not okay. Yeah, like it makes no sense to me. Like the whole cultural appropriation thing seems to run so counter to what we believe in as Americans as far as inviting people into our country and celebrating other people's culture. Like, that's what American culture is. It's just a mashup of a bunch of other people that came here and they shared their culture with us and we kind of made this whole thing and that's who we are. So I don't understand this. Now we have to go separate everything back out again. I'm like, you're missing the point of why this country is what it is. Like... I don't get it. It should be, we should mix it up even more. I mean, I mean, and how granular do we want to get? And I think we're going to talk about some of the YA stuff, but it's like, okay, so I have brown and, and blue hair. So can I write about someone that has blonde hair? Am no, Nancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, I'm from New York. Do I, can I only write about women from New York? I mean, it's just, it's absurd. It's absurd. Yeah. And so self-limiting. It's like, it's so sad and small and joyless. Like, oh. I know. It's like, why Why should anybody just limit themselves to their current lived experiences and you don't ever try to experience anything else? Like, like that's, that's the whole point of what you're supposed to be doing as an adult is you're supposed to be enjoying other cultures. You're supposed to be traveling. You're supposed to be meeting new people. You're supposed to be gaining new information and in broadening your worldview like what is this super narrow nonsense like i don't i don't understand i guess the argument is that um you know people feel that you know whether it's women or minorities or people that have a disability or they you know they're they're gay or trans that they were you know in quotes silenced or not recognized or maybe they didn't recognize themselves at a certain point as 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 not having the opportunities that that others had and now that, you know, people do have more opportunity, it's like, that's my turf. I get to write about that. I'm trans. I get to write about that. You don't. It's like, okay. Um, I, I mean, I, obviously, I don't agree with it, but I think that that's probably their argument. As far as I can tell, but since you already brought it up, I do want to touch on the piece that you did for LA Times, the op-ed that you did on outrage culture. Yeah. Because... I think the the points that you were making there were really good and breaking fourth wall for a second. Of course, all links will be in the show notes if you want to read Nancy's pieces. And you should read Nancy's pieces in the show notes. But the the point that you made about this current environment where there's this constant need to kind of like feed the beast. Like there's always mm-hmm. like you have to keep 
putting like wood in the oven to keep this fire going of outrage and it's 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 this incredibly toxic mentality that i don't understand like i don't understand this need to be so angry all the time i don't really understand these people but it's it it is that and it's like this constant like more 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 new new things new things to be angry about the this other thing we were angry about it for 15 minutes but now we got a new thing to be angry about and it's just like it seems so exhausting well that's it's someone so i met heather hying who was um the wife of um yeah Weinstein and they were the ones that were run off of Evergreen and she's she's great and um, we were talking about how you just have to you know split <laughs> and I, I mentioned this in the in the Times piece you know the more you can split people apart into smaller and smaller groups the bigger the field of people that you have to hate right so maybe it used to be like the boys against the girls or, you know, the Jews against the Catholics, or and now it's going to be, you know, well, uh, well, obviously, you know, I didn't even know what intersectionality meant a year ago. I wish I still didn't know what it meant. But, you know, if you keep breaking things down, it's more people to potentially have problems with. And that seems to be something that is very attractive um, to some people. And I got to say, you know, it's got a lot more, you know, sometimes I wonder if we live in an echo chamber, Jen, and we probably do because, you know, we're reading some of the same stuff. Every podcast I'm listening to is about, you know, these sorts of, you know, this hot house of cancel culture. Um, but it, it's, it, am I wrong in saying that it seems to have a pretty good amount of traction, not just in academia, but even like in the culture and in politics? I think it's starting to gain more traction in politics. And I actually just talked about this on the podcast that I recorded earlier today. And I don't know if you follow things quite as much as I do, but this whole bill that the House just passed that was supposed to be an anti-Semitism bill, but just ended up becoming an anti-hate bill because mm -hmm. all of a sudden everybody had to get their group in there. Like it couldn't just right. be about this one situation that was supposed to be addressed. It just became this whole big thing and i'm like did intersectionality just come to congress it really kind right. of feels that way right actually i did see that and i and i and i thought the same thing and, and i have a question for you because i did not read as deeply into the bill did they did they include in the bill how these these you know hate groups or you know intolerances or anti whatever how they were going to identify it or was it sort of like you know I can't explain porn, but I know it when I see it. Like, did they drill down and say, yes, we're going to outlaw X and X and this and that, and we're going to know it by this? They didn't even take it that far. It's just basically saying, we condemn hate against all of the peoples that get hate. So it, was, well, it just ended up being it was stupid. Like, it was just really well, stupid. That we, we, I just wrote about this for reason a couple of weeks ago. Um, the city council here had a meeting where they uh, unanimously passed a resolution that they were going to ban um, alt-right and hate groups from, uh, from Portland in general, but with absolutely nothing in the resolution for how those groups were identified, which of course means it's with the wind. I mean, so you've got, you know, this particular group of people in now, and they're going to say it's X and Y, and then whoa, leadership changes, and it's going to be you know V and W, and 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 people actually got up, citizens, and said, okay, we hear you, and you know nobody likes violence against anybody, but how are you going to identify it? And the mayor was like, I'd like that basically stricken from the record. It has nothing to do with this bill. It's like, yeah, it doesn't because you're not identifying that. This is all about like this kind of vague feelings about things, and nothing nothing concrete, nothing you can even really put put to work in a legitimate way, right? Yeah, and it's, it's especially when you're talking about the alt-right, the definition of alt-right seems to be very fast and loose right now. Oh boy, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm apparently alt-right. You know, I'm a liberal from New York City, okay? That, that I am apparently now alt-right by dint of the fact that I wrote about that city council meeting for Reason Magazine. Oh yeah, that's I'm sure you're just about point. you're about to go like carry the tiki torch out into the road, you know. You know, I'm so popular in Portland, Jen. You just have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm mixing myself another Paloma because you told me I could do that on your show. You can do whatever you want here. It's it's a this is a free zone. You can do whatever that's you right. want. All right. But 
Yeah, another thing that I wanted to touch on uh, as far as the LA Times piece, and I do want to talk about the piece you did for Reason, not the one you just referenced, but the, the 15 Minutes I Hate one, is that this is becoming this very weird thing, and in crowds, out crowds are very much a thing. And it seems to me more and more that when you're in your little in crowd, you view anybody in your out crowd, and I should I should probably preface this by saying certain people, not everybody, because some of us can actually differentiate that, okay, somebody's in my out crowd, I don't agree with them, but whatever, carry on with your life. But some people seem to take it as everybody who's in my in crowd is awesome and everybody who's in my out crowd is like subhuman. And therefore I can say and do whatever I want to these people because they're not, they're part of, they're, they're part of my out crowd and I, I don't even really have to view them as people. And no, that's, that's, right. that's the only thing I could think of as far as how vicious these attacks get. It's like, how can you view somebody as another human being and be this cruel to them? Well, you know, it's an, that's interesting because I, I don't know if they see it as cruelty. I think they see it as justified. I think they see it, and I mentioned this, I, sorry, I wrote like three pieces about this in one week, and I, I don't know where I'm <laughs> quoting this from. But in one of them, I was like, you know, the the sort of, you know, hate that my husband has been shown in the crusade to, you know, do better than what they believe I'm doing when I'm speaking about, you know, trying to have some nuance in terms of me too. Um, it's like they see it as progress, but to where and for whom? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, progress has to be a straight road. Of course, it never will be. But who, who gained like in the crusade against, you know, any of these things. Who who gained in the in the crusade against the burrito girls? The burrito girls didn't gain. The people who decided to destroy them didn't gain, as far as I can tell. I mean, they wouldn't even stand by what they wrote. So how is this progress? Yeah, and it's it's not. And it's just it's this really weird thing. And I keep going back to. The, the chapter in Kindly Inquisitors about oh. the, the fundamentalist threat, where Rausch makes the point that for fundamentalists, if you disagree with them, you're either stupid or evil. Yeah. And you can see it in these people that, like, they think that you're either stupid or evil, and it really seems like they're erring more on the side of thinking that you're evil. And so, of course, if you think somebody's evil, you feel no compunction about trying to eliminate that person because you feel like you're on like this crusade to eliminate this evil person. Right. Well, that's right. It's funny you say that because I, I have a, I, I brought up Rausch's book because there's a quote that I think about all the time. I have it underlined on page 27 and it says, what is the right answer to the person who demands something because he is offended? Just this too bad, but you'll live. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you'll live. It's like, Let's have a conversation about it. You're offended by what I said? Okay, great. Let's talk about it or not, or go about your business. Um, but in terms of the evil and stupid, yeah, you know, if someone is stupid and you attack them, then that's, you know, it's kind of unfair because they're just dumb. Like, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to really just destroy this person because they're dumb? That's not very much. Bob. But if they're evil, then you, you know, you've got a box to stand on. I also think that um, these people, some of them, it gives them an identity to fight, you know, to be the figurehead, to be at the front of that ship leading your, you know, your crew of fellow destroyers. You know, it, it's, it must feel sexy to them. Yeah. And I, I saw somebody and I can't remember the source and I wish I, I wish I had bookmarked it or something, but somebody had actually likened like this feeling of attacking somebody of this, like just going after somebody on social media or something like that as like an orgasm so yeah, like like that same kind of like that same kind of release and i'm like okay maybe you guys need to log off social media for a little while and um we can tell them a better way to do that Jed, I think. yeah, yeah. There's, there's better ways there's more constructive ways to get that feeling that's all i'm saying yeah but... um i also think and i and i wish i had um i saw a quote about it the other day i wish i downloaded it because it, he said it so well um they're really at least, okay, to me, again, my point of view, there's a real joylessness 
to these crusades, I think for the people who are engaging in it. And and Heather Hying had said to me, you know, exhausted is a big a big word with these crowds that are fighting all of these fights on every side. There's a fire, yeah. there's another person to bring down. They're so exhausted of fighting. And she said to me, they're fighting their own shadows. They're fighting, they're fighting things that do not need to be fought about. Like young people, go out, go have a good time. Stop this, there's no reason. Well, okay. I know that they see that there is a reason to do this. I realize they think that they're they're engaging in some sort of redress, but it's it I don't think it's helping anything. I mean, for instance, Evergreen, where 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 Heather was, it's going down the tubes. Hampshire College is gonna close. Because you can't you can't give over to an 18 year old, 20 year old student body a say of how the faculty is going to run the school and then it's not being run. It can't, it can't, it can't exist. Yeah. it's, it's funny because these people are always so literally exhausted, literally exhausted all the time on social media. That's all they ever type. But to go to the point about evergreen, like I've, I've obviously I've followed it. I've seen, I'm sure you've seen Moynihan's vice oh, yeah. piece that he did on that. So and, brilliant. Oh my God. But he was yeah, the first it just, Shout out to Michael Moynihan. And I know he was because Heather told me, he's like, they were getting stonewalled. The local press wouldn't follow it. The governor, Inslee, now running on his one platform thing, uh, uh, he they went and appealed to him saying, my husband is being followed and being threatened with death. You need to come on campus and help. Crickets. But Moynihan showed up, so shout out. <laughs> Always to Moynihan, especially oh, yeah. when you when you get good Moynihan face on a Vice interview. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's it's. I think the issue that's going on on a lot of college campuses right now, and I kind of talked about this before when I did my my book review of Coddling of the American Mind. I don't know if you've read it yet. I have. Uh, uh, I'm listening to it on tape. Yeah, but the concept of universities now not so much being places of higher learning the way that we always understood them when we were growing right. up but now it's this business that needs to cater to these students that are coming here because now it's not so much an environment of education it's an environment of business where okay these kids are coming here they're paying insane amounts of money to come here insane. we have to keep them happy so that they keep staying here and giving us money well i've also been told that um the professors are and the faculty are absolutely terrified of being branded as racist or sexist or you know whatever ist that you can come up with and so they may not really privately agree with what they're being asked to do but they know that if they come out and disagree but man, is that a slippery slope. I mean, you you can't do it. I mean, <laughs> how do you give over control to 18 year olds? Who would ever think this is a good idea? I yeah. mean, you can talk. I mean, did you see what happened at Portland State the other day? By any chance, the guy with the cowbell? No, oh yeah, I think I did oh. actually. Oh. Yeah, and it's just this whole, interrupting speakers like first of all that's rude as hell second of all like if you don't like a speaker then just don't go like i don't understand why this is so difficult well you're but no one else is allowed to try you know it's funny because i wrote the article um for uh quillette and it kind of compared you know it's like a toddler walking into a dinner party and 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 the toddler must be placated before the you know grown-up discussion can continue and then two weeks later we've got this guy who walks in and it's, I guess it was like a young Republican. I, I'm sorry, I don't really know exactly what the guy was coming to speak about, but apparently this person with the cowbell thought that's not cool. So he stood up there for one hour with a cowbell, smacking it so that nobody could listen to anything. And then at the end said to him, well, you know, the last time you were here and spoke on campus, uh, there were there were many attacks against trans people after you spoke here. And what do you think about that? And the guy goes, um, I've never spoken here. And the guy with the cowboy goes, yeah, well, I just made that up because I can do that. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, what the what hell, man? This? What I mean, then then I'm going to backtrack and say, do I actually want to like try to have 
I would love to try to have civil debate um, with anyone that wants to have a valid sort of discussion about this. But that's not even, I mean, what is that? This is just brattiness. Yeah, I mean, these are not people that are interested in actually having any kind of intellectual debate. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of keep screwing up. It's like you think that you can engage these people. And I, I think people really need to take a step back and start recognizing who you can engage and who you can't engage. And people like that are not interested in having a conversation. They're interested in being the center of attention and making it about themselves as versus letting just somebody else have the podium and say things that even if you don't like them, like I said, just don't go like the easiest way to keep people off of a college campus is don't go to whatever event that they're invited to, because obviously colleges do have to pay people to come onto campuses, like especially famous people and stuff like that. They don't normally do it for free. So if, the college realizes that there's no value in that, then they're going to stop paying these people, but don't interrupt it for people who do want to watch. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the hubris in thinking that just because you don't like this thing that nobody else gets to enjoy it either. It's it's like, I don't, I don't understand these people. Um, I, I, it's not, um, I don't think that they probably understand themselves. I don't think there's a real long game there. So when we did, we did the, um, the hashtag me neither show. And, um, you know, my feeling is, you know, there's plenty of, there's thousands and thousands of podcasts that I don't listen to. I listen to the ones that I like. And if people were not interested in my show, they certainly don't have to watch it. But to say that I'm, what I'm doing is dangerous when it's not, um, what don't watch it if you're not interested. Um, but then what happened is that, you know, we had like 5,000 viewers and within, you know, a month we had a hundred thousand viewers because, it, you know, Leah, my partner is like, do you think we should send Camilla, the girl that had started this sort of <laughs> campaign against our fruit basket? Um, it's like people actually look, we're not particularly brilliant or anything, but we were just trying to talk about things in a way that I suppose was not what people see immediately. You're either going to see one thing or the other. We're sort of like in the middle of things, just trying to talk about, as I've said before, like there's a vast chasm between rape apologist and, um, and believe all women. Like most of life happens between these two poles. So let's talk about the great things that Me Too has accomplished and let's talk about where it hasn't been great. Like I don't understand why that is so offensive. It's not, it's not offensive. Um, which brings me, if you don't mind, um, did you by any chance see uh, Jennifer Senior's um, um, article in the New York Times two days ago about teen fiction and the perils of cancel culture? Yes, and I'm I'm so surprised, especially since we I guess we can go ahead and talk about this now, the the Kosako Jackson situation and how much wow. traction that's really starting to get in like mainstream media. Wow. So I want to read a little. Um, so so when you talk about purity tests, purity tests, I guess, you know, sort of like what we're talking about before. It's like, well, you have brown and blue hair. You can't write about a blonde. Oh, you're, you weren't from Kosovo and lived through that. You can't you can't write about it. So she wrote, which I thought was very good. Um, she said purity tests are the tools of fanatics and the quest for purity ultimately becomes indistinguishable from the quest for power. So. Is it the case that someone who attacks his book, let's say, or attacks my, you know, me neither attacks my husband, it's really about, it's not about really being offended. It's just a gambit for power. Yeah, it's exerting power over people. And what creeps me out so much about the, the whole YA situation is this idea that a very small group of people, and honestly, like, this is a small group of people, like, you would sure. think that, listening to it, you would think that, oh my god, these people are being attacked by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. No, it's like tens of people. But yeah. it's this weird thing where you think that you can tell an artist how to create their art. Like, how dare you tell somebody, you need to alter your book because I don't like this. It's like, how about you go fuck yourself, write yeah. your own damn book, if That's you don't right. like mine? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
it's like but but now of course the you know terrible irony for this dude whose name is what is his last name sorry uh, uh jackson right is that he'd been he'd previously been part of that culture where he kind of was demanding and and part of the mob that went after other writers and you know I guess he, you know, he's not going to do it anymore. Obviously, um, it's what, we'll Jen. What kind of art are we possibly going to have? First of all, anybody that's ever worked for a magazine or you, you can't have art by committee. You can't do it. Like you can't have fifteen people edit your article or your book. It's going to literally be like a bowl of cold oatmeal. There's just not going to be anything left, and that's where this is going. If every single, if you have to get every single person's sliver of possible grievance and problem with your work, what are you going to be left with? Nothing. I mean, nothing. I mean it's, it's, you're going to be left with nothing. Nothing. And, and people, I mean, he canceled himself, right? I yeah. mean, not only will you be left with nothing, but people are not even going to do it. And that's what, you know, um, who, you know, Jesse Single was writing about this all last week. I know we were both writing about this. And definitely your listeners should be following him because he's just writing some badass stuff, man. Um, you know, people are just not writing. They're like, fuck it. I'm not going to even do it. I'm not doing it because I can't risk having my life destroyed. Yeah, that's what depressed me because I read his three-part series that yeah, he did yeah. on on like just responses he got. He put out a question, and people emailed him, DM'd him, and stuff like that. And the ones that really bothered me are the writers who basically just took themselves out of the game. They're like, "I'm not even trying to do this anymore." Because I'm like, to to be able to be a writer, and especially to get to the point where you can be a published writer, like a published fiction writer. That's a huge deal. And like to walk away from that because what 12 people got pissed off about what you wrote. I'm like, that's just profoundly sad and shitty to me. Like it's, that's exactly right. And I think we should, we should have hashtag sad, sad and shitty because it really, really is. And the problem Jen is that, yeah, it's 12 people, but then, you know, you it just exponentially on, on, on Twitter. What else did Jen senior say? She said, um, even by t talking about this kind of cancel culture, even by Twitter standards, the YA, um, you know, cancel people are, it's a hothouse subculture, self-conscious, emotional, quick to injure, not unlike teenagers themselves. So, you know, 12 people becomes 12,000 people. And I can tell you, having 12,000 people, or even if it's 120 people screaming at you about what an awful person you are and how they are going to destroy their your life and they actually are destroying your life it's not fun um but some of us will not stop writing or talking because not because it's like well i don't want that dude win it has nothing to do with that it's just because it's just a ridiculous situation and there's there's it's just completely uninteresting to say like, okay, well, I'm gonna go with that. No, no. Yeah, and I'm thinking this will continue up until the point where it starts costing somebody money because if you decide to cancel your own book and you could also see this, I think it's a better example, although it's not the one that's getting the traction right now, but, and I'm probably gonna butcher her name, but Emily Wenzow, the, 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 oh, the one that the, the the previously the earlier in the month canceled book. Yeah, so, J J yeah, January's canceled book of the month. Right, right. But her deal was she actually had a deal with I think it was Delcott. I think was her publisher, but she had a three book deal that numbers were never like officially published. But I heard that at auction it had gone for like high six figures. Mm -hmm. So we're talking like big big money here, and she ended up canceling her own book and all I can think is like whatever advances your publisher paid for you whatever they've paid into this book they're not going to let you keep that like they're going to expect it back if you don't publish this book no, so right. this I, I think is going to come to a point where like this is going to start costing people money and eventually I'm hoping somebody just goes completely punk rock on these people and is like you know what I'm not canceling my own book screw you I'm not giving my money back I'm not canceling my book. I'm not caving to you. 
go fuck yourselves, basically. Jen, that's absolutely, absolutely right. So this, neither of these people had to self-cancel. Look, you, it is not fun having the mob on you. I can I can tell you this, though. Of course, it's been worse for my husband. Um, but you know what? Fuck you. No, I'm not. I, no, I'm going to keep doing what I do. That's what I do. And I, I, I understand people are terrified. I understand people, you know, they get death threats or they feel so much shame for reasons that, they, I mean, maybe... Maybe there are reasons people should feel shame, but I don't think either of these writers had any reason to feel shame. Um, but they just decided that for their own reasons, they wanted to get out of the game. But there are plenty of people that are not going to be out of the game. It's just like, next, whatever. What's my next book? What's my next podcast? I'm not, I- I'm not, I'm not engaging in your game. I'm not playing it. Yeah, and I can see publishers going forward, like, even if it's not something that's part of contracts now, but if this becomes a thing, I can see publishers starting to put clauses in contracts saying that, you know, if you decide of your own accord to pull your book, like, it's not our decision, it's your decision, you're going to have to start, like, paying us back some money, because from what I understand, Jackson's book was already, like, printed, like, in boxes, ready to go, like, Publicity had already been done, everything had been finalized, everything was ready to go. So the publisher is out that money now. I don't even understand, uh, and maybe you read about it, like how you self-cancel a book. I mean, what legal leg do you have to stand on when you've already written it, you've been paid your advance, the books are printed, it got a starred review in wherever, Kirkus or wherever it was. Like, how do you sell, how do you just say, okay, no, pull, I mean, if I were the publisher, I'd be like, dude, we we ain't stopping. We're publishing the book. Like, how do you even do that? Yeah, and that's another thing. Like, publishers are going to eventually stop putting up with this bullshit. They're going to be like, you know what? This is this is what we agreed on. We're publishing the book. Like, we've already put X amount of dollars into this. Like, we paid you your advance. We've paid all this money to have the book printed. We've paid editors. We've paid sensitivity readers, which Jackson <laughs> was a sensitivity reader or yeah. is still a sensitivity reader. I don't know how that works. But we've got all this money into this book. Like, we're not just going to, like, chuck it into the dumpster. Like, but, that, but you know, if you read, and you did, you read, and, and your, your, your uh, readers, if they go to the links, they can read uh, Jesse's pieces. A lot of these publishers, they'll, like, you know, you, you send them a query or you send them the first hundred pages of your book. I mean, in, in court, according to the young A stuff, uh, YA stuff. Um, and they say, yeah, sounds great. Oh, and then they find out you're not of the race of your character or something, about, and they just drop it. Like, they're not even going to have the kind of courage and balls to say, God, man, this is guy's a good writer, and this is a really cool story. It's like, nope, they're going to want you to pre-pass the purity test until you commit. And I'd like to think that that's not the case. I'd like to think that editors are just like, you know what? It's good work. We're going to publish it. But I think that they're probably just as scared you know, some people are scared of this stuff. Some people aren't, and they got to make money. And they see historically what's happening here. They're just not even going to do it. They ain't going to buy the property. They're like, ah, oh, no. It's yeah, and that's it. and that's that's the other thing. It's like there's people that are going to lose out on opportunities who are genuinely good writers. In what? but because you don't fit this specific little mold, your work's not going to get picked up. And it's hard enough to get published in the first place. But but here's the thing, Jen. It's like. This dude that we're talking about, he's black, he's gay. He wrote a book about a black gay teenager, but apparent, you know, it was in Kosovo. And because he didn't live through that, it was disrespectful who people did. It's like, so wait, how exactly do I need to fit your mold? Yeah, to write- it's like, it doesn't make any, I mean, like. It's like, it's like asking me to write with my hands tied behind my back. It's like, let me just write. Let me just write what I want to write. And that's what people want. People do not want to read little sanitized, like they don't want your little your little CV and your little bio on the back to pass every fucking smell test. It's just, it's just, uh... Yeah, and like the only thing I was worried about on Jackson's book is when I saw the subject material, I was like, okay, have you researched enough about the Kosovo War to actually like write about this and be historically accurate? And according to Jennifer Senior's piece, which is a it's it's a nice piece. She's a very very good writer. Um, uh, he didn't, in her opinion. But okay. And, see, and that and that would be my problem. But that's just me and my weird wonkishness <laughs> about wars from that area of the world in that particular time. But that's just me. But yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's I I don't I don't see anything good coming of this, and especially the biggest people that suffer are the people who just were like, I just want a new book to read. Right. The reader. Like, I just want to read this book. I want to go away. I want to read about, I want to go on some sort of like crazy flight of fantasy or whatever. Like, are we allowed to like Game of Thrones? I mean, he didn't live back there. I mean, he's like, what? Like, what are we allowed to like anymore? (laughs) I know. It's like, and and through this whole thing, I was reminded of Memoirs of a Geisha, which when Uh, it came out, I mean, there was a bit of pushback that it was a white man writing this book about a geisha. But obviously it didn't get canceled. It went on to be a huge bestseller and then it went on to be a huge movie and everybody, everybody lived. But it's to the, like, if you tried to publish something like that today, like, there's no way. Like, there's no way. It's funny you mentioned that because I couldn't think of the name of the book. Sorry, if you hear me mixing another drink in the background, it's because I am. Um, uh, I was trying to remember the name of that book earlier. Yeah, because that was like, God, that was like the late 80s or something like that? Early 90s? I think it's like early 90s. I remember yeah. I read, I, I, I love the book, honestly. But I was thinking about it, I'm like, Okay, if a like a straight white American man decided to go write a book and the first person narrative and it's of a geisha of this Japanese girl who was pre World War Two, so obviously this is not his lived experience clearly, but I feel like he did a nice job in writing the book and being somewhat historically accurate and it was also just it was a good story, like it was a nice story. And like, that's all it needs to be. Exactly. I didn't read the book, but you know, hooray for anybody that has a badass imagination. That's just going to write something great. Just do it. I mean, just do it. I, yeah. The only thing that offends me about books is when they just do a bad job, like a nonfiction job, a nonfiction book, you do a sloppy job. You do, you know, you write bad fiction with lots of adverbs that pisses me (laughs) off. Right. So all right, but before we leave out of all of this, before, I mean, this episode, I don't necessarily mean this topic, I do want to talk about the reason piece that you did about surviving your 15 minutes of hate. Yeah. Because I, I love that piece. It's so well written, and it's written kind of in a tongue-in-cheek way, but I think the thing that I like about it is that it's honest in a way that I feel like a lot of people are not encouraged to be honest when they're in the middle of one of these situations. It's like you, you, everybody's always like, you know, don't let the bastards find out they're wearing you down and don't like stiff up her lip and be the happy soldier. And it's like, you know what? No, I'm, 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 I am scared. This is getting to me. Like I am kind of shitting my pants. Like there's not a space right now where people can like freely acknowledge that and I really want to applaud you for doing it and it's it's obviously it's a great piece and everybody should read it and go bookmark it and print it out and put it on your refrigerator (laughs) because the day will come for you too that's true but it was just I just I liked it because it was so honest in a way like I said that I feel like people don't really have the space to be honest at least not in the moment like maybe six months later you write that piece and you're like oh look guys things sure were scary back then it's like okay but you you couldn't admit that in the moment i don't think you could write i mean i i I can't speak for other people i wouldn't be able to write that piece six months later you have to write it like right now like the the thing that when you just said that i just remember my husband's hands sweating so much he was just like ah, ah." it was just like so much weird weird terror that you usually don't have in your house and it was everywhere and it was it was just so fucking destructive i mean it really has been destructive our 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 lives have changed a lot because of it um and uh yeah i thought it was better to just sort of kind of it was kind of a bit of a real-time thing right boom 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 eight Mm -hmm. steps and there you are and uh including you know my being a blithering idiot and going online you know woman acts badly online news at 11. (laughs) um it's like hey you know what this is how it works you hear about this stuff from the outside here's here's what it's like on the inside you know but guess what still standing right yeah and i know it's it's something that in i i know i kind of touched on this a little bit but the happy warrior mentality 
that a lot of people like to promote that and that is like, oh, well, if it happens to you, you just got to put on a brave face and soldier through it and you'll be all right. And it's like the stakes are different for every person. Like some True. of us can do that. Some of us can just be like, fuck it, whatever. Some of us have a lot more to lose than other people. So I, I don't entirely like this idea that people should just say or do whatever it is that they want on the internet obviously you should do that but this idea that you should just like grin and bear it i'm like no there's people who if the mob comes for them like that's their job like that's their livelihood that's their money that's their reputation that's their ability to get further work and it's like i don't feel like that is something that's fully acknowledged right now that there is a cost to doing this for some people and that's why it's effective and that's why these people go on these campaigns is because you can hurt somebody very badly so, well I, I can tell you that it has hurt very badly um for for his business um but i wonder do you think and i as an honest question do you think that they understand uh and i'm going to preface this by saying i actually don't think i've actually ever done this myself like in the past however many years I've never um I've never staged campaign against anyone else I don't think so I mean I've tried to ask myself that honestly but um do you think that they take into consideration the hurt that they will be causing or they're just that's just not really interesting because they're going to be on to something else in 15 minutes you know I I like to think that they don't because it is a lot more sinister and a lot more depressing to think that they do know what they're doing the damage that they're going to inflict and they do it anyway because that kind of takes it from that that stupid to evil sort of thing right like if you right. do a thing right. and you don't really think about the consequences you're just stupid if you think about the consequences and you do it anyway that's evil I, I agree with you. And I'm going to say, and, and, you know, also because often, you know, these folks are young, I don't actually think they think about it. And um, I, I put that in one of the pieces I wrote, which was, you know, it's not the initial assault. It's the, it's the little bits of radioactivity that's left behind that, that do the most damage. And then you are, I mean, we're still dealing with, with what's gone on. I don't actually think, and, and maybe it's because I'm like the eternal optimist. And I think you probably are too that I don't think that they realize, or most of them don't realize um, the damage that they're inflicting. It's just something to do. It's another little hit of outrage. And my friend said it was something that I should be part of the pylon. And now I'm gonna go off and you know do something else. I don't think that they think about it. Um, you know, that's unfortunate, um, but it's probably always been thus. And uh, we just have a new delivery system that's very, very fast and very aggressive. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, I like to hope that you're right. And that's another reason why I really like the reason piece, because maybe if more people wrote about their experiences in the, the online mob hurricane as it's happening to them, like maybe people might stop to think for a second and be like, holy shit, this really messes up somebody's life. Like I'm really hurting somebody. And just like, like I said, that honesty of just saying that, like, yes, this hurts, this sucks, this is shitty. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting on a brave face here, guys. I'm not stiff upper lipping this. Like, I'm scared as hell right now. I, I think that if, if, if people were listening to that message, I think that they probably would have been like, yeah, man, maybe I should just go out and like, you know, have a margarita somewhere and not do this. Um, but I don't think that they probably are. Because, you know, we listen to our crews and um, they feel that they have a mission, I guess. I, I don't really know, Jen. I don't engage in it. And so um, I would just hope we could all do better. How's that sound? I like it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to stop writing. I mean, that's never going to happen. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So. But yeah. another thing I wanted to talk about before we, we leave off this topic, kind of, but... And it was something I was thinking about while I was reading your piece. And that is that, like, it's this kind of comes in waves for people. Like, okay, you have the initial incident and that's bad enough. But then you kind of have this spread out and then you start having this 
kind of collateral damage in the way that, and, and I see a lot of people that I'm friends with right now kind of going through it, but this idea that all of a sudden, like people that you thought had your back and people that you were cool with, all of a sudden they're either like silent or actively piling on to you. And it's just like, and that's, that's like the, the secondary kind of hurt and damage that comes from this is finding out that like people that you thought you were cool with, you're, you're not. And like kind of finding out who your real friends are. And that, that hurts too. Like that's, that's a different kind of hurt. Uh, yeah. Now I have to say, I haven't had a ton of that, but, uh, Heather Hying had said to me, um, he, these kinds of incidents, your friends will show you who they are. And I got to tell you, man, that is just unbelievably true. Like the home crew, they're, they're just totally there. Uh, guy that we're friends with on, on, uh, on, on Twitter, Ben Price. I didn't even know this dude. He was driving up freaking bourbon to bring to my husband just to be like a stalwart. I was like, damn dude, just like so kind. Um, different people I work with, just like, give me this article, let's do this. I've also had someone I won't mention, unbelievably close to me, just bail. And that was pretty rough. Um, but you know what? I get it. They, they, people have their own reasons. Um, I mean, that that hurts. And I think that hurts more than like the initial attack to me. Well, like that would be more hurtful. Like if somebody, if somebody started some petition against me, like they did against she was like, okay, this sucks. This is hurting me financially. But that that's finding out that like people will bail on you is like a different kind of hurt. Well, her, her opinion of it was that what I was doing was stupid and I should have understood that the mob would have come after me, but I, I don't accept that. I just don't, if I accept that something I might want, okay. So I, I think I've said this before. The first feature article I ever wrote was in 1994. I went and interviewed John Wayne Gacy, um, the serial killer before he was executed. And when the piece came out, just my first piece, Jen, I'm like, man, I'm in the newspaper in the LA Weekly. And I, you know, that was back before the internet letters to the editor. I was so excited to see like, what kind of letters it would get. And the letter was, if there were any justice in the world, Nancy Rommelman would be the next victim of the next John Wayne Gacy. So that's the letter that they printed. All right. So if I, if after that, I decided I was just going to keep working, uh, this I will just keep working too. But you know what? People are going to have their opinions and they're going to tell you there are things you cannot talk about. There are things you cannot write about. And I just fundamentally do not accept that. There's nothing that I can't talk about or write about ever. So full yeah, stop. And, yeah. And I mean, even, even if, I thought what you were doing was a bad idea, like, which I don't, obviously. I mean, I'm not going to, like, bail on you. Like, that's just, that's, that's shitty. <laughs> well, you know what? This particular instance, there are, there are extenuating circumstances, and I love her anyway, and hey, we go on, right? So. But, I mean, I guess the flip side, and to try to end this on something of a positive note. Let's do it! Because <laughs> this has just been such, a, such an upper of an episode here we're so sorry guys really <laughs> but i guess there is kind of the friends you make along the way argument yep. and as much as people may abandon you you may find people that have your back that you didn't even think would and then you make new friends and oh. new people that support you and have your back and so i guess there is something of an upside or a silver lining to this as shitty as it is no absolutely no 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 i, I have to say it and it, this sounds kind of nutty but it's been really rough on my husband i'm i've been pretty good <laughs> throughout all of this it's like i'm writing for new people my friends have my back i'm doing new work it's like you know what we're just gonna go on this is something that happened and it just leads to new things and new places and new locations yeah it's all good yeah, good. and I, I hope everything works out for Din in his his business because I I don't want to see anybody fail. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? Sometimes like you change incrementally, and sometimes you change fast. So that's all right. Change is good. Yeah. <laughs> but so I guess we can go ahead and start wrapping it up on this note while we're still on a positive note. So yep, go ahead, plug your stuff and plug oh, plug I'm your coffee it. too. I'm plugging it. All right, guys. You want to help out because this story was a 
it really affected you, right? Go buy some of my husband's coffee. Ristrato Roasters, the website is RRPDX. That's Richard, Richard Pony Dog X ray.com. Got a lot of really good coffee there. And if you want to read a pretty good nonfiction book, which Matt Welch at Reason gave a best of 2018 to, that's my book that came out last year called To the Bridge A True Story of Motherhood and Murder. I think Jen's read it. I sent her a copy. And uh, that'd be great. I and did Jen, read it, by the way. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for sitting down and talking to me because I wanted to talk to you about this because I feel like it's kind of like a timely topic. And it's it's interesting to have an opportunity to talk to somebody who's currently going through a situation. Because like I said, people don't normally want to talk about it when they're going through it. But I think that if more people did, maybe maybe that might help the situation. I don't know. Maybe it'll yeah. work. Who knows? Possibly. But Let's go. Let's just go. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. Jen. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. So there is Nancy's and I's very long, rambly, not entirely sober conversation about things and stuff and people. And I hope that you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. And as always, if you did make it this far, thank you. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.